Well, good morning once again, everybody, and welcome to Word for the Week, our um, weekly book study series here at Cornerstone Faith Community Church. My name is Pastor Jeremy Heidkamp, and I am very, very excited to be with you today as we uh, take a look at Chapter 4 of Max Licato's book, Traveling Light. Uh, this particular week, um, Licato is, uh, is taking us through what he calls the prison of want, W-A-N-T, the prison of want. Now, if you've read um, this chapter already, you fully understand what he means by this prison of want. Um, in some other instances, we might just refer to it as discontentment, um, a lack of contentedness with who God is. Um, but I really think that uh, Lakato uh, spelled this out for us in a, a much deeper and uh, a way much deeper way than than what we would normally consider just simply lacking content or satisfaction um, he begins of course by drawing us back into the 23rd psalm the shepherd psalm um, when he says the lord is my shepherd i shall not want he's focusing on that idea that that david suggests about not having a want because the Lord is everything that we need. I liked on page 30 um, where he asked the question about being in prison. He says, are you in prison? You are if you feel better when you have more and worse when you have less. If you are if joy is one delivery away, one transfer away, one award away, or one makeover away. If your happiness comes from something you deposit, drive, drink, or digest, then face it. You are in prison. You are in the prison of want. So that's the bad news, he says, but there's good news that you have a visitor. And your visitor has a message that can get you paroled. Make your way to the receiving room. Take your seat in the chair. Look across the table at the psalmist David. He motions for you to lean forward. He says, I've got a secret to tell you, the secret of satisfaction. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, um, there are so many things that come into the discussion about satisfaction for us. You know, of course, there's the desire, the want for new things, better things. You know, we live in a world um, that I would say is more in tune with things that are new and and uh, the, the latest greatest of things than ever before um you know we want at one point we had said in our hist the history of the united states that uh, an era like for example the 1950s right after world war ii where where industry was just churning 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 we had learned so much about how to make cars and and all other kinds of things as a result of the war and so we now put those into practice um you know in our own daily lives and so uh, factories were creating things like um you know new new versions of cars convertibles you know all different kinds of things there were microwave ovens that started to kind of hit the scene shortly after that we had um television color television we had all these different things that kind of came in that industrial revolution boom that we had after world war ii and in that moment some people said you know um what is happening to our world it seems like we're never satisfied there's always something new always something better and this is where things like advertisement really really got rolling um and and it's fun to look back at some of those old advertisements uh uh, to try to get people to spend the money they had on on their things you know today in our society we're no different in fact i'd say we're we're definitely probably worse at that than we were um, we are just inundated with advertisement with people saying you need this your life depends on this you you've got to have this you know the the one that i always roll back to is is the apple phones or any really any phone that comes out a new phone you know, I've got a phone in my pocket. It works perfectly well, but for some reason or another, the cell phone company, the creator of those cell phones, believes that they've uh, they've added one additional thing to the newest phone, and so therefore, I need to have that one too. Um, it it just it just builds this bulk of stuff around us. 
I don't know if you've ever seen the show on TV about the hoarders. One of the most devastating things I've ever seen are these hoarders who really literally have so much stuff around them that they, they, they can't breathe, they can't function, they can't move. It's just stuff. On page 31, um, Lakato says, all that stuff, it's not yours. And you know what else about all that stuff? It's not you. Who you are has nothing to do with the clothes you wear or the car you drive. Jesus said, life is not defined by what you have, even what you have a lot of. Heaven does not know you as the fellow with the nice suit or the woman with the big house or the kid with the new bike. Heaven knows your heart. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. When God thinks of you, he may see your compassion, your devotion, your tenderness, or a quick mind, but he doesn't think of all those things. There are people in my life that I have known um, who I would say have a problem with things. Um, from time to time, I'll admit that I can I can have a uh, I can get fixated on this thing or that thing, um, and it's so devastating. I think when we really stop and think about all of that stuff, those things that we we felt were so important, we just had to have them. And then we look back and we go, what did it really do for me? Nothing. Uh, on page 32, Lakato says, are you hoping that a change in circumstances? Now, this is not so much about stuff. This is about the, the really the function of your life, the circumstance of your life. Are you hoping that a change in circumstances will bring a change in your attitude? If so, you are in prison. You need to learn a little secret of traveling light. What you have in your shepherd is greater than what you don't have in life. What you have in your shepherd is greater than what you don't have in life. And so then on page 32, Locato gives us a question to answer, and I would encourage you to, to pull out your, uh, your suitcase um, uh, document worksheet. Add this question for this week. It's a great one, one that I think you could probably spend more than a week really contemplating. He says, may I meddle for a moment? What is the one thing separating you from joy? So on your sheets, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to write the word joy. And I want you to write joy with an equal sign. What gives you joy? What are the things, and I know I'm talking mostly about things, but it could be relationships or people, but what are the things in your life that you say, that really brings me joy, okay? That's the first step of this. Now, what are the what are the things? things what is the one thing that separates you from really truly being happy what don't you have that you say if i had that i would be happy how do you fill in this blank he says i will be happy when what when i'm healed when i'm promoted when i'm married when i'm single when i'm rich how would you finish that statement i will be happy when so joy equals what for you what is the one thing that sort of separates you from happiness? And then, and then really, when will you be happy? What is the thing that will be happy, that will make you happy? Write those things down on your sheet and really think about them this week. I like this last phrase. He says, if your ship never comes in, if your dream never comes true, if the situation never changes, could you possibly be happy? If not, then you are sleeping in the cold cell of discontent. You are in prison and you need to know what you actually have right now in your shepherd. I think that the most critical piece of this puzzle is a recognition, a, a realization, an acceptance that we really truly do have everything we need. I mean, I, I think about all of the people that I know that I really know in my life. And honestly, maybe I'm just particularly blessed, but honestly, I can't think of one person who, who doesn't have the basics of everything they need. Are there people in my life who, who, who are still struggling and, and, have, and could, could do well with more income or, or, or a, a better house or something? Yes, 
But at the end of the day, I, I really struggle to find someone in my life who doesn't have shelter, who doesn't have some sort of income, who doesn't have enough food. Um, unless, I mean, obviously, maybe I just don't know about these people, but you get my point here? I think we are so blessed and we forget that. We forget it on a daily basis because the world says to us there's more. What if God is the more? What if Christ is the more? I hate to sound like a broken record, but I got to go back to this verse that has really, really become sort of my, my grounding verse for everything. John 3 and 30. He has to become greater. I have to become less. You know, why do I need more? Can't God and Christ and my salvation, my character, who I am, and all the things I've been blessed with, can't that be enough for me? I really hope we can all come to that place. I hope you guys will have a, a great week this week. I, I know this is not the most uh, uplifting part of this thing, but, but the uplifting part is we've got a shepherd who loves us and gives to us. So have a great week. I will see you again next week as we look at chapter 5. And until then, uh, just hope you have a great week. Blessings to you.